too bright to see the light. It's a play on words. And I think you're going to see why it is entitled that uh, by the end of this presentation. When I was thinking of a title for this presentation, I, I just went through and I, I, I studied this material for years. But uh, I always try to think of a nice, you know, eye catching, ear catching uh, uh, title that really kind of gives a glimpse or a picture into what the study is about. And so some of you may not really know that yet. Uh, as why it says too bright to see the light. Uh, but I'm going to show you why that's the case tonight, because there are some people who are living in a condition in which um, the, the life that they're living in and the experience that they're having is the, 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 the light, the, the artificial light that they think they see and that they think they are involved in is so bright that it's blinding them from seeing the true light. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'll try to say that one more time. Some of us are, are living in a reality where we think that the light we are experiencing in our life, and of course I'm using that metaphorically, the light, that, 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 uh, that state of mind, that state of being that we think we are living in, that we believe is just right, that we're living in the right way. Some of us, uh, that, that artificial false light is blinding us so much. In other words, it's so bright, it's too bright that you can't see the real light of Jesus. In other words, the light of Christ is not able to penetrate. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to dial down that artificial light, <laughs> that fake false light. We're going we're gonna to get rid of that. And we're going to really amplify the true light of Jesus tonight by taking you again through an epic story of Scripture. I don't know if you've been following so far as to what we've been doing, but we have been walking through a beautiful narrative of Scripture. I'm revealing and I'm showing by taking a puzzle piece here and a puzzle piece here, which has a, a, a picture of, of, of the overall image. And as we begin to place those puzzle pieces right where they belong, we started out with generally nothing, but we're building and building and building and building and building until by the end of this seminar, you're going to have this beautiful picture. And, and it's basically like we're reading a story of prophecy and we're learning who God is. We're learning the plan of the enemy so that we can be aware of his schemes, his lies, his deceits, so that we can reject those and receive the beautiful, righteous light of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, I want to start out with a scripture of reminder. I want us to be reminded of what it is we are involved in in these last days. Notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. In fact, this is verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. We've probably read it many times. But the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what does this text tell us? My friends, we are involved in war. We are involved in warfare every single day. And this is really the war behind all wars. This spiritual warfare that we are involved in is like no other because we are literally fighting against spiritual wickedness and powers beyond our understanding, beyond our vision. In other words, it's there, it's working against us, and the only way that we can win the war in the end is if we have a supernatural power of God working on our behalf, working through us to bring glory to him and to ultimately break the back of the enemy. In other words, break the power of the enemy. We can't do that. Only Jesus can. But the Bible reminds us that we are engaged every single day, that our war is not with flesh and blood. We're not, with, we're not out here fighting necessarily. The ultimate war is not necessarily against our brothers and sisters. The devil would like for us to believe that. But at the end of the day, we are wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places, much of which we cannot even see, but we see its effects. We understand its effects. And we see 
this ultimate spiritual warfare uh, really, really uh, amplified and takes its effect or basically takes its root uh, right in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which we have studied and we've read. And this is what the Bible says. This is Jesus speaking to the serpent, right? He's speaking to the enemy, speaking to Lucifer, that, that devil, Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What is Jesus saying here? He's reminding us that this whole entire Bible story, remember we did an illustration of this. If you walk through the front door of the Bible, you come to the book of Genesis. You're not even three chapters into this thing before you start to see conflict. You start to see the work of the enemy and he, as he has deceived God's people. And so if you walk through the back door of the Bible, you also see uh, some conflict. But it's interesting, the front door of the Bible begins with creation. The back door of the Bible ends with recreation. But from Genesis 3, which is what we just read, Genesis 3, 15, that, te- that is the thesis. I just want to make that clear. That is the thesis statement for that it tells the story of the entire bulk of Scripture. In other words, from Genesis 3 all the way through to the latter chapters of the book of Revelation, what do we find the bulk of this story? It's spiritual warfare. It's the enemy trying to destroy the works of God. It is conflict and covenant. And we know ultimately, as we have learned, that the great conflict of Scripture is that the enemy is attacking God's holy law. He's attacking God's commandment-keeping people. He's trying to keep Jesus from coming to do his work. And we're going to see tonight, as we're going to dive deeper into that plan, we're going to see that in, in, in order for him to try to keep the seed of Jesus from coming, He had a specific plan and work, but then we're going to show how that morphs into our time as it sets us up for tomorrow night's topic that is entitled History's Greatest Religious Cover-Up. And so let's go back into scripture here. And I want us to be reminded that the Bible tells us that from Adam's time all the way to Noah's time, there was was probably approximately about uh, 1,600 years, a little more than 1,600 years that it transpired. And what do we read about by the time we come to Noah's time? The enemy was hard at work. He wanted to make sure that the works of God was destroyed, that the power of Christ was eclipsed. And so notice what we read in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Okay, so what is this saying here? I just want to amplify this because I didn't get to see say much about this in one of our previous topics. Many people believe that this is the story of what is what is popularly become known in the world as the Nephilim. In other words, many people believe that this is a, a story in which when it says the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they basically began to have marital relationships with them. Many people believe that this, um, these sons of God are angels or angelic hosts, powerful uh, you know, supernatural figures. And then the daughters of men would represent obviously the women of the earth, the creed, the seed of, of Eve. And so it's interesting that they've created this scenario and they call it the Nephilim where, you know, these angels came down and they basically impregnated these human women and out came these powerful, you know, super babies that was able to basically, you know, become giants and launch the world into horrible, horrible, horrible sin. And which finally the Lord had to say, oh man, I got to get in here and intervene. I've got to destroy all of these little powerful demonic babies. that's you know, coming out because of these special relations between these evil fallen angels. Again, the angels, when it says sons of God, they believe it's the evil fallen angels. I just want to make it, make it clear, my friend, that is, that is the, there's absolutely no support for that in scripture. You have to really stretch, the, you know, you have to really stretch the scripture. Um, you have to really, really irresponsibly and eisegetically just, dis, just dissect the word of God and to make it say something that it absolutely does not. And I want to make that clear. The Bible makes it clear who these sons of God are. And I'm going to tell you who the sons of God are and the daughters of men in just a moment. But if you go to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 makes it very clear that the sons of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. Okay? 
It's talking about God's people. And we see in the Bible that, yes, there is, in, in the case of the story of Job, that first chapter of Job, where it says that the sons of God gathered in what appears to be this heavenly council in heaven. Yes, in one sense, in some cases, based on the context, sons of God can indeed mean angelic figures. But there are multiple texts in Scripture also where the sons of God can be based on the context. And in this case, it is, it's basically talking about God's church, His people, those who are of His holy seed, His lineage, those who are led by the Spirit of the Lord. And we know that these sons of God and these daughters of men uh, obviously represent a contrasting group. How, how do we determine who these, do these two groups are? You just got to read the context. Notice this is Genesis chapter, this is Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. You know what the previous two chapters are? It's the genealogy of the lineage of Cain and the genealogy of the lineage of Seth. And so the, the sons of God in this case are those who are led by the Spirit of God. It's the lineage, that holy lineage, that came through Seth. And we know ultimately, in this case, uh, we know that it leads all the way to Noah because the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But who are these daughters of men? Obviously, if you go back just a couple of chapters earlier, you'll find that the Bible makes it very clear that this, this lineage of, of Cain comes basically heathen, these heathen people, these people that did not follow in the ways of the Lord. And there's three women mentioned in that lineage of Cain that begot sons and begot all of these evil men that, of course, when it says by Genesis chapter 6 that the sons of God came together and started having relations as they saw the daughters of men, basically what it's saying is the church, God's people, the, the righteous, begin to intermarry and intermingle with the unholy lineage. They begin to go outside the church and marry to the people, the heathens of the world, and they begin to mix those cultures and mix those ways so that the ways of God became blurred, that the lineage, the holy lineage of God became more blurred and more blurred and more blurred so that evil on the earth, in fact, that's what the next scripture actually says here. Notice verse 5 here. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his was only evil continually. And it grieved the Lord that it had come to this, and he had to intervene. And we know the story very well. There was only eight people out of the entire world that were saved through the judgment of a flood. And ultimately, it was because of the righteousness of one man, because Noah found grace in God's eyes. Noah followed the Lord, and he put his hand in the hand of the Lord. He trusted God. He talked with God, and uh, his family was saved because of it. But we also know if we continue reading the story, and a lot of this is a little bit of a, a, um, a review, but we're getting to something good here. We know that from Noah, there were three sons, and we know those three sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you have questions about how did our world become what it is today? All of us are somehow, some way from one of these three, okay? Uh, but in the beginning, as the, as, the, as the lineages were starting to spread and be created throughout the world, uh, we know that if we study uh, closer, the line of Shem was where the holy seed of the Messiah would go through. That would be the holy lineage through the line or the lineage of Shem. And of course, the heathen, uh, paganistic, evil nations of the world that would ultimately become the enemies of God's people came through, uh, unfortunately, the lineages of Ham and Japheth. And this is where we kind of pick up with something new. This is something where I think we really need to pay attention because tomorrow night's topic is really depending on our comprehension of tonight's topic. Uh, and so be, be very uh, attentive to what we're about to say. The Bible tells us that Ham had sons, and one of those sons was Cush, okay? And notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10. And it's, this is starting with verse 8. It says, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be mighty, a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And of course, it goes on to say in verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was 
Babel. Okay, before we go any further, we need to talk about this Nimrod, okay? This is a character that is mentioned very, very few times in the Bible. Uh, and, and there's very, very little about what is said about Nimrod. So you have to kind of do a little bit of a historical research. But I think that if, even if you didn't have all of the historical research outside of Scripture, there's enough in that text that we just read in verses 8, 9, and 10 of, of Genesis 10. When it says that Cush begot Nimrod, and you look into what Nimrod was all about, when it says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, that he was mighty before the Lord, understand, my friends, this is not good language, okay? It sounds like it. But when you read into the works of what came from Nimrod, obviously he's through the lineage of, of Ham, and, uh, and from Ham onto Cush, onto Nimrod, we're about to see that the devil would do some horrific things through uh, the, the, the seed, through the influence of Nimrod and the many nations that would come from his influence. When it says that he's a mighty man before the Lord, understand this is not talking, this is not a positive context. He was a mighty man in the sense that, yes, he had a lot of power, he had a lot of influence. But I'll tell you, the word, the name Nimrod in and of itself should tell you the story. Nimrod means rebel or the rebellious one. Okay. And we know that if you study into the historical writings of Josephus, as well as other historical writers, they tell the story very clear. Nimrod was a mighty man. He was a very influential and powerful person. But he had set out, set out at an early age uh, from the time that he began his influential reign to make sure that he would launch a war against God and God's people. He set out to establish, as the Bible just said, the kingdom or the nation of Babel or the city of Babel. And we know from that point, okay, from Genesis 10, I want you to notice this, my friends, Genesis 10, all the way through to Revelation chapter 18, through the entire Bible, we keep seeing Babel popping up, popping up. Of course, Babel uh, means confusion, as we're about to read that. And Babel, of course, is the root word of Babylon. Babel would become known as that great city. Remember, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, as we studied last night. Uh, Babel, it once was a great city. And then, of course, spiritually, metaphorically, this, this city becomes known as a counterfeit false church in Bible prophecy, symbolic language, because it turns into a Shia harlot. And so in this case, we're talking about the literal influence of Nimrod and the spiritual influence of the culture of Babylon. And my friends, I, I, just, want, I just want you to be reminded of this. Let's go through the scripture so we see how powerful of an influence this was. This is literally the origins of the nations of the world. And we see in Genesis chapter 11, as it does not specify here in the actual text of Scripture, but if you go and study historically, most, uh, most scholars and historians believe that no doubt uh, Nimrod, because it says he begot Babel, or from him came Babel, uh, what we're about to read here in the very next chapter, which is Genesis 11, we see the influence that he had upon this city, that it drove the people who were all of one language at one time, it drove them to also take on the spirit of rebellion. And that's what it says here in Genesis 11, 4. It says, and they said, say, talking about the people, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is, to, is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Notice, not for God, not to give God, for ourselves, me, me, me. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered all over the face of the whole earth. Of course, this is language, if you read into the story of Nimrod, it's language basically uh, from the rebellious spirit that Nimrod had coming off of hearing the stories and hearing all of the family stories about the flood. Because again, this is Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah. So he would have been the great, great grandson of Noah, right? And so uh, hearing how God, this God would destroy the earth, they decided as legend tells us, and as the scripture kind of alludes, that they're going to build this tower. It's going to reach into the heavens. It's going to reach high. So that if God decides to flood again, they're going to get back at God and they're going to shake the finger at God and say, ha ha ha, you can't destroy us because we've outsmarted you. We've created our own empire. We've created our own name. We're our own people. And so when God saw this rebellious spirit happening, he cast a judgment upon them. And that's why in verse nine in Genesis 11, it says, 
Therefore, its name, talking about the city, is called Babel. Of course, Babel means confusion. Why? Because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad all over the face of all the earth. So this, my friends, is the origins of how we got all of the multiple nations and multiple cultures and all of the different languages. It all found its heart right here in Genesis 11 coming off of the work and influence of a man who had set out to rebel against the kingdom of God. And who do you think is behind all of this? Of course, it's the enemy. Of course, it's Lucifer. Of course, it's Satan. He is behind this influence. He's the the ultimate influence behind this work to try to shut God's work down. Because again, God still has a people. He, they, they came, the, the, the Messiah seed would come through Shem, but you have the lineage of Ham and Japheth that would ultimately, through this experience and others, uh, of course, all of the nations, even Shem's lineage, the nations were confused. They were, they were all scattered all over the earth. That's how you have all the, in, the different languages, the different nations, the different cultures. And so God still has to bring about his seed. He still has to bring about his people. And he does see within the heart of man that there is someone that he can build this beautiful kingdom of God from. And we know that that person out of this experience, of course, would come the man named Abraham. And so notice what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. It says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Okay, Uh, let's continue on to reading, and I'll stop and pause and explain that. So they served other gods at one time, right? It says, then I looked at your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. Okay, so let's make sense of this. The Bible says, after this whole, because you're, you're, you're reading this, we just read this from Genesis 11, this Tower of Babel experience. The nations are scattered, the languages are confused, the different cultures begin to be established as they're scattered abroad all over the earth. And it just so happens to be that right there in the heart of Babylonian society, in a small little sub-region of Babylon known as Ur, you have a man by the name of Abraham, and God saw that he had a pure heart. God saw that this man could potentially be a man that could continue on his holy lineage. And it just so happens to be that Terah, the father of Abraham, obviously was of the lineage of Shem, that holy at holy lineage. So that must meant that obviously Abraham was of that descendant as well. And so God called Abraham, and we read that in scripture very clearly. God called Abraham out of Babylon. Why? Because he's in the heart of this false, false worship, this the, the, the heart of the state of confusion. And so we're going to see throughout the rest of this presentation, the influence that this paganistic, heathenistic, a false worship system of Babel that Nimrod ultimately started, how it finds its roots and its webs all throughout scripture and even tries as the devil behind the scenes, the devil is trying to influence God's people. He's trying to destroy the work of God. He's trying to pervert the seed so that that Jesus never comes. But ultimately, my friends, the purpose of this message is to show you how the devil has never changed. He knew that even if he couldn't defeat the seed, that the work that he was doing through these pagan nations and their false pagan worship, that it would ultimately pervert the world so bad that it would bring us about in these last days in a very, very dangerous situation. And we're going to see what that is as we continue through. But I want to just pause and and make mention here that when God called Abraham out of Babylon, he brought this brother and his family um, through, I mean, he, they literally had to go for it through one heathen nation to another to make it to the land of Canaan. Um, you know, Abraham's, Abraham was a, was a mighty man. He was a very righteous man. He trusted in the Lord. Um, but I just want to show you some of the nations around that he would have had to deal with the uh, kind of the, the influence of some of these heathenistic nations, because Out of these nations, again, the lineage of Ham and Japheth from Nimrod into Babel and Babel's uh, rebellious 
backward false system of worship that began now to scatter like a spider web all throughout the lands. God had his one true man, Abraham, and he's going to establish his true church through the lineage of Abraham. But all around them are these nations that believe and worship in these false gods. And of course, the devil thinks that by using these nations and using their false their false worship, their false deities, uh, that he's going to choke out, kind of like thorns. Uh, he's going to choke out God's work. And I just want to show you, you're going to see this come up, up through the Bible many, many times. We're going to talk about what is known as the sun deity, because in Babylon, Babylon was kind of the heart and soul, the Mecca of sun God worship. Now from that into Egypt, into Mesopotamia, other parts of Mesopotamia and the Middle East and Asia Minor and even Asia and Europe and all of the other parts of the known world, you're going to see this, these deities, these, these gods and false gods and goddesses of sun worship and fertility. You're going to see this come back up in scripture over and over. And I'm trying to give you an idea of what Abraham would have had up against him as he's traveling through the land, making his way to the Holy Land. Notice this. So we're talking about the sun deity. This is very prominent throughout heathen cultures. So all of these, they're going to have different names, but we're talking about the same influential God. Egypt, of course, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to hear names like Ra, uh, Horus, and Osiris. And of course, uh, Horus is uh, in the Egyptian uh, faith is known as the the god of the, of, the, of the rising sun. And then you have Ra, which is the god of the noonday. And then, of course, Osiris, which is also known as the god of the dead, but he's also known as the god of the setting sun. And so it's interesting that Ra, out of these three, because he's the god of the noonday, when the sun is shining brighter and the sun is more dominant during the day and noontime than any other time, of course, Ra becomes that ultimate sun god in Egypt. Uh, and of course, there's other gods as well, but that's their main dominant God. If you do your research of Egyptian uh, history and, and, and the influence of these false pagan gods, you will see in Egypt, it's always Ra. Uh, they're, they're giving homage to Ra. Also in the Mesopotamian, Canaanite, kind of Persian, Assyrian, uh, 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 Middle Eastern area, uh, you have the sun god Shamash, or in this case, you're going to see this come up a lot in the Bible, and that is the god Baal. Uh, there's lots of Baals. There's, there's different types of Baals, but it's all the same. It's a god of the sun or a god of fertility in many times. But this right here, my friends, is something that you'll see come up a lot in Scripture. The, the devil is trying to use it, uh, use this influence to destroy God's works. Buddhism and Hinduism over in the Asian countries, you're going to see that those two faiths or those two regions of the, you know, the, the Chinese and the Indian cultures, their, their number one sun god deity was Surya. And so we'll see that as well. If you do some history, you'll see that. And of course, in the Greco-Roman world, that's Greece, uh, the Hellenistic faiths and the Hellenistic uh, influences over into the Roman culture as well. You have the gods of Helios and Apollo and of course, Sol. These are gods of the sun, gods, deities of the sun uh, that, that you see is very, very influential throughout the known world during the time of Abraham and even during all the way through uh, to even after Jesus's time. And we'll see this come up quite a bit in tonight's message. You're also going to see these deities of fertility. And so back to Egypt, you have Isis. You've probably heard of that. Uh, Hathor and, of course, Apis. And you'll see this come up in Scripture quite a bit as well. Of course, that Mesopotamian, Middle Eastern cultures like the Canaanite cultures, the Philistinian cultures, the uh, Assyrian and, and, uh, and the... Uh, 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 Persian cultures that you're talking about this, these people, they served Ishtar or Ashtoreth. And of course, also a God of fertility known as Tammuz, which you're going to read about in scripture as well. Uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, again, that, that's that Southern kind of Asian region. You have a uh, Guanyin and Parvati. Okay. So these are the gods of fertility or the goddesses of fertility. And then of course, in the Greco Roman or the Grecian Roman cultures, you have Venus, Aphrodite, and of course, notice there on the end, Diana. And you'll see even in scripture, for instance, Acts chapter 19, Paul's over in Ephesus. And you see this Roman influence, this Roman um, uh, paganistic culture, even in Ephesus, as Paul is trying to do his missionary work. And he has a showdown with the people uh, because uh, they're out there worshiping Diana 
And Paul shows up and he starts preaching the gospel and he runs into some trouble in the city of Ephesus. So you see these influential deities come up over and over and over in scripture. And I just want to kind of trace through the Bible story, my friends, and show you really quickly as we're making our way to the end, just how influential and how powerful this is in the sense that the devil has figured out his, this is, this is like his, his, his recipe of disaster. This is his recipe that works, that seems to always pull God's people back into a state of confusion. It pulls them into a state of deception, and God is constantly calling them out. He's constantly pleading for his people to wake up and not be deceived, and we're going to see this over and over. So we're going to start now. Remember, we just we talked about Abraham. So God called Abraham out of Babylon. He called Abraham and his family out of that false system of worship. He said, if you'll be my people, I'll multiply your seed and I will, I will bring my, 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 my seed, my Messiah, Savior through your people and I will multiply your descendants all over the earth. Well, he also told uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he predicted that the people of God would fall into more than 400 years of bondage many years after he was gone. And of course, we know that sometime after uh, Joseph, which was the son of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, after Joseph died, um, of course, they, they ended up in slavery there in Egypt. That is the children of Israel. But we know God pulled his people out of Egypt, right? He delivered them from Egypt. And eventually, they are brought back into communion with God at Mount Sinai. And so they've arrived at Mount Sinai. So here's where we pick up our story. And the Bible tells us a rather interesting story. I mean, notice they've been in kind of one of the meccas of false worship for more than 400 years. But God has just showed himself in such a powerful way to deliver them out of that false system of worship so they can again be his chosen people, his royal nation. And so right here, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. And it's interesting because God calls Moses up the mountain. He, he, he's already presented his, his covenant to them. They've already said, yes, Lord, we will be your people. We will obey your covenant. We will keep your commandments. And so then God says, wonderful, wonderful. This is going to be great. And so he tells Moses, Moses, come back up the mountain. I want to make sure that we have this in writing. I want them to be my people. I'm going to be their God. So you come up the mountain and you spend some time with me. I'm going to write these commandments in stone. And so the Bible says that Moses was up Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And the people of Israel become a little weary. I can imagine after about a week, they, the people started murmuring, wait a second, where, where, where's Moses, man? Moses, man, Moses already left us. And he said he was going to come back. It's already been a week. That brother's probably done went up that mountain and died, right? And, you know, I could just imagine the murmuring of some of the people. Oh, no, 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 he'll, he'll come back. Just, just give him some time. It's, it's Moses. Moses is led by God. Everything will be okay. I could imagine the second week goes by, right? Man, it's been a while, two weeks, and Moses is still gone. And I can imagine some people are murmuring, Moses isn't coming back. He probably went up there and died and fell off a rock and hit his head or attacked by an animal. Who knows? And this probably went on the third week, and you could imagine the fourth week, and you're getting down to those last few days. And finally, the people turn on the Lord. I mean, just within days, my friends, they, within days of them telling the Lord, well, all that you have said we will do, and God laid out his commandments. Don't worship any other gods. Don't bow down to any graven images. Don't take my name in vain. Please remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And he specified all of what it is he wanted them to do as to be in covenant relationship with him. And within days, just a few weeks, they could not trust in the Lord and his word and the word of Moses enough that, well, while Moses is up on that mountain, he receives a message from God. Notice what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7 and 8. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, notice this, that, that he saw the golden calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets to the ground. 
okay, or he said, cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Now, I want you to catch what is happening here. He comes down, and what does he see? Now, this, this picture that I'm showing you here, this is obviously an artist's portrayal of what it might have looked like, but I can tell you, my friends, it was probably a whole lot different than this because in the heathenistic practices that they would have saw back in Egypt and many other heathen nations around them, this type of deity, this type of worship, worshiping idols, worshiping false gods, usually came with some type of sensual, over-sexualized, naked dancing. And I could imagine that Moses came up that mountain and he looked down upon that mountain and saw, heard the music, heard the drums, I'm sure, heard the, all this loud booming and he heard all the hooping and the hollering. And he looks down and sees these people, some of them probably dancing in, in what appeared to be trances. And, and it just, I mean, it made him mad. So the Bible says, you know, he, you know, he had one of those weak moments. He lifted those plates up and he just threw them down and it broke at the base of the mountain. And my friends, and I have to ask a question here before we go any further. Where in the world did these people get this idea to make a golden calf? Because while Moses is up that mountain after they've already agreed that they're going to obey God and keep his commandments, they somehow twist and, and manipulate Aaron into taking all of the gold that they had brought back in the form of jewelry and ornaments and things that they had brought out of Egypt with them, and they, they, they twist and manipulate this brother into making them a golden calf. And my question is, where did they get this idea from? I mean, it's obvious, right? They would have saw this for more than 400 years as a people. Obviously, these people didn't live for 400 years, but still, generation after generation after generation, back in Egypt, where do they get the golden calf concept? It's clear, right there in Egypt. Right there in Egypt, one of the gods of fertility is known as Apis. It's the, it's the, Apis was the son of the fertility goddess known as Hathor, okay? Which actually is also connected to the goddess Isis. And so this is a goddess of fertility. So what are they doing down there? They're dancing, stark naked probably, hooping and hollering, giving their homage, their worship, and their allegiance to a false God already. And of course, the Bible says it really angered the Lord. And, and Moses even had to plead on behalf of the people. He said, Lord, because the Lord was like, look, I'm about to go down there and light these brothers up. And, and he said, look, Lord, please have mercy on them. What will they say about you if you go down there and just light them up and destroy them? What will what will be said about you throughout the, the nations? And of course, the Lord already knew all of this. And he said, OK, you go down and you deal with it and you find the ones that are faithful to me. And so that's why we read here in this next part. Notice what it says in verse 26 and 28 of Exodus 32. It says, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Of course, if you read verse 27 there in that chapter, uh, Moses tells the, 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 the uh, tribe of Levi, he says, look, you take your weapons. He says, we're going to get rid of this evil satanic presence that is in our camp because the devil is already infiltrated. So you go out and you find every man, woman, and child, whoever it is that is not standing with the Lord, and we're going to root them out. I know it sounds horrible. It sounds like a, it is horrible. It's it's ultimately the, the works and the fruit of Satan to have to bring this upon God's people. But God had to make sure that his lineage was was preserved, that the work that he was going to do was going to make it through so that his name and his character could be vindicated. My friends, we see this all the way through. In fact, 40 years after this, because they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, they, didn't even, they couldn't even go into the land of Canaan because they were so rebellious and such a stiff-necked people. So now they're at the brink of entering the promised land 40 years later. And of course, there's an evil king uh, who is the king of the nation of Moab. His name is Balak, and he meets up with the prophet of the Lord, whose name is Balaam. And, and Balaam, I mean, his brother, I mean, he was a prophet, but I mean, he did, his story didn't end very well, I, I suppose. And Balak basically says, look, I want you to curse these people before they come in my land. We don't, we don't need these people. We know we've heard the stories about how the, the creator God is leading these people. We don't need their trouble. We don't need them coming in, taking our land, you know, and taking what's ours curse them. Balaam says, man, I can't curse these people. They're, they're led by God. This is God's people. 
And he says, no, 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 please curse them. So he tries to do it. I, I can't do it. They're too protected by God. And so ultimately, long story short, the prophet of the Lord basically lets the cat out of the bag and tells this evil king. He says, look, if you're going to overcome these people, you've got to turn them away from their God. You've got to deceive them into believing that they don't need God or that they can turn away their attention from the Lord and forsake his commandments. And so we find this story in the Bible. Notice what the Bible says, beginning in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to, uh-oh, there's that, there's that word, Baal, of Peor, that's the sun god, or a sun god, also known as a, a god of fertility. It says, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord. Out in where? Where's he, where are they hanging them? Out in the sun. That the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And those who died in the plague were twenty. 4,000. My, my goodness. My friends, what this story reminds us is that all the way through this journey, has the enemy, has the enemy backed off? Has he, has he stopped attacking and trying to influence God's people with these pagan false uh, idols of worship? Absolutely not. 40 years later, they're on the brink of inheriting uh, and going into the land of Canaan. And right there we see the devil works his, his, his sly work. He, he, he comes in and he twists the minds of the people into taking their attention off of the Lord, becoming enticed by the women of Moab, the women of the world, the people of the world. They begin to intermingle and intermarry and have marital relations uh, that were not uh, ordained by the Lord. And we see that they were joined, as it says, because a lot of these, a lot of these harlotry, harlotries that you see where they're having these, uh, these uh, unlawful sexual encounters came with false worship. And the false worship also brought about not so good marital relations, except these weren't real marital relations. Uh, these weren't uh, married couples. These were people just committing harlotries before the Lord. And it just it fired the Lord up. It made him angry. Uh, you know, we serve a God that has feelings just like us and he loves us and he wants to save us. But sometimes we can break his heart. And of course, Israel done their fair share of that. And we see in this case, the Lord says, if you want to worship the sun, then I will hang you into the sun, facing the sun. And that's exactly what we see here. You see the influence of this false sun god worship coming up over and over and over again in scripture. Let me give you another one. Finally, God brings about, he brings them into the land of Canaan as they're entering in and making their way towards the holy city that will eventually become Jerusalem. And uh, God establishes several judges over Israel. These were, these were appointed men and women who were to bring about God's righteous way, judge Israel and lead them in the path of righteousness. And one of those judges, of course, that was, that was uh, raised up for this time was Gideon. And notice what God did through Gideon. This is, uh, this is found in Judges chapter 6, verse 24. It says, Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. But then notice, it says, Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of who? The altar of Baal. Yes, he told him, you get rid of that altar of Baal. That's a false god. So tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. Cut it down, cut down the wooden image that is beside it. So Gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said, for, uh, said to him. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image that was beside it was cut down. So what we see through this story here that we just read, my friends, we see that God raised up these judges, including Gideon. Gideon was one of these judges of Israel, and he used them to bring them ever so gently back into the way of God. And of course, it didn't come easy, but it happened over time, in which eventually the Lord was able to 
teach the people and lead the people to not worship these false gods, to not worship these pagan deities, these, this sun god Baal, which was a Canaanite god, the god of the Canaan. They're in the land of Canaan. All these Canaanites worshiping the sun. As soon as it rises at noon, at the end of the day when it's set, they're worshiping this, the sun as if it's a god. And the Lord says, no, don't do that. that is, that's, that's just what I created. I'm the god of the sun in the sense that I'm the god over the sun. I created it. I'm the one that makes it move. You should worship me not these false created deities. And of course, who's behind all of this? It's the devil. The devil is still trying to infiltrate God's people and God's word. And so what we see is God is rising up of people. He's making this nation. He's trying to shape and mold Israel to be prepared to be led by him as a holy nation, a beacon of light to the rest of the world. But do you think the devil's going to allow Israel to become a beacon of light to this dark, sinful world? Of course not. But we see wonderfully that eventually a couple of kings come into play. Of course, we know those kings to be Daniel, or excuse me, David and Solomon. They weren't perfect men by no means, but there was a sense of peace. There was a sense of order and leadership under the rule of David and Solomon. But of course, unfortunately, good things come to an end. And then we come to a time in which after Solomon has passed, the kingdom is left to Solomon's son, who was not a good king. We're talking about Rehoboam. His name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was not a good king. The Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord to the point to where the kingdom of the, the, the nation of Israel was split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Ten tribes of Israel went to the north, known as Israel. Two tribes went to the south, known as Judah. OK, and uh, we see, get this, we see that from Rehoboam, when those two kingdoms split, of course, Rehoboam went uh, to, uh, to the, to the uh, he went to the southern kingdom to lead them for a time. And of course, another evil king, which, oh man, you got to read the Bible on this. You can go read uh, first and second Kings. It'll tell you the story of this. The, the king that went to start things out in the northern kingdoms of, of Israel, the, uh, the, the 10 tribes of the north, his name was Jeroboam. And you're going to read in just a few moments, every single king after Jeroboam, my friends, was an evil king. In fact, get this. Let me put this in perspective for you. After Solomon, there were 39 kings in all of the nation of Israel, both northern and southern kingdom. 39 kings before they went into Babylonian captivity. Only six of the 39 kings, the Bible says, did good in the sight of the Lord. The other 33 kings, the Bible says they did evil or they were questionable because they did something that led the people astray. And most of the story is the people of God being led into these horrible paganistic practices, these heathenistic false idols and worship. And we see it all accumulates down here with the leadership of a king by the name of Ahab. And he has taken on a new wife and her name happens to be Jezebel. Notice what the Bible says. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 says, the Bible, the Bible says, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of, there, there's that name, Jeroboam. He was the first king of the, of the northern kingdom, uh, that is the Israel, uh, Israel kingdom. He says, uh, Walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, notice the name, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria, and Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger, than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, my friends, let me just clarify this real quick. If you've read this story, then you know how significant it is in, in, in the overall story of Scripture. It has one of the most famous, uh, um, one of the most famous showdowns in Scripture uh, that, that's famously known as the showdown atop of Mount Carmel. How this came about is Ahab had led the children of Israel into horrible, horrible uh, false idol worship. 
worshiping false god, worshiping the sun god Baal, doing all these horrible fertility uh, sacrifices and rituals. And I mean, it was just horrible what had transpired in Israel. That finally God told the prophet Elijah, he said, you go tell this brother that if he don't stop and he don't turn back to me and he don't lead the children of Israel back in the way of God, of, of my commandments and in the way of prosperity, spiritual prosperity, that I'm not going to allow it to reign in Israel for three years. And we see that that is exactly what happened. One year goes by, two years goes by, no rain. You could imagine they're wondering where Elijah is by now because Elijah delivered the message. It's not going to rain. And it didn't. Until finally, after three years, three and a half, three, three, three and a half years, God sends Elijah. He tells him, he says, look, you go back to that King Ahab. I want to send you back to him. And, 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 and I have a clear message that I want to send to him. And of course he did. He goes back to uh, the king, back to the city there. And of course he shows up in, in the, at the palace there. And I could imagine the guard, as the Bible clearly says, you know, guard saw him and thought, you know, called him, you trouble of Israel. There you are, you trouble of Israel. You're, you're the reason why all it hasn't rained and all of our crops are drying up and all of this horrible famine has come upon us. You're the reason for all this trouble, you troubler of Israel. And he says, I'm not a troubler of Israel, it's Ahab. He says, you go tell Ahab to come here. I've got a message for him. And he says, no, 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 you're go, I can't leave you because as soon as I leave and go get him, you're going to be gone again. And he says, no, 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 I'll be here. So he goes and he retrieves Ahab and he delivered a message to Ahab. He says, God's had enough. He said, you gather up all your false prophets of Baal and you gather up all your false prophets of, in this case, it was Ashtar, which was basically the goddess of fertility. There was 450 false prophets of Baal and 400 false prophets of the goddess of fertility, Ashtar. And so he says, you gather up all 850 of these prophets and you have them to meet me atop of Mount Carmel. And all of Israel needs to be there to see this. And so this is what becomes known. I love this story. Becomes known as the famous showdown atop of Mount Carmel. And so they're there on the top of the mountain. And so... Uh, Elijah says, look, we're going to see today who's the true God. He says, you go build your altar, build your altar for Baal. He says, make it happen. Build your altar for Baal. And then call, if, if Baal be God, if he's the true God, then have him to rain fire down from heaven and, and just consume this altar right now if he be Baal. And the story is amazing, my friend. These brothers and sisters, again, often with pagan worship and pagan uh, rituals, they're out there cutting themselves and shedding blood and doing all these, you know, sayings and rituals and they're praying and they're chanting. And this thing went on almost all day long. And the Bible says that even Elijah was being a little sarcastic and making fun of them. He's saying, yeah, pray a little louder. I don't think he can hear you. And I can imagine they're out there just losing their mind over the fact that all of these hours had went by and transpired and nothing has happened. And finally, Elijah had enough. He said, that's it. So he goes to that altar. He tears down the altar of Baal. He builds up an altar for the Lord, except he done something even amazing. He dug a trench all around that altar. And he takes these big vats of water and he soaks the altar completely where, it, where the water runs down the altar all the way in and it fills up this trench. And then, of course, it happens. He prays to God. He says, if you are the true God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of this world, the God of your people, then have fire come down from heaven and take and consume this, this, uh, this altar. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And my friends, it's amazing to know that that very day, God sent a strong message because that very day, through Elijah, he used Elijah to call out this false worship, to show his anger against and his the seriousness, the genuine seriousness he has against this false worship, these, these false idols, this false system that eclipses and shadows out his work and his power. He, he called it out. And that day, 850 false prophets lost their life, my friends. We see all the way through the story of Scripture. This is a thing. Notice what the Bible continues to say. We're going to take you into the time of Jeremiah. Now the people of Israel are preparing. This is right before they're taken into 70 years of captivity under Babylon again. Notice how it started with Babel through Nimrod. It's about to end up to Babylon uh, because the people seem to, seem to just not care about the Lord. And they're, they're, they're turning away from the Lord. They're allowing these 
false deities, the sun god and the, the, the gods of fertility and all these horrible false gods to overshadow them and to cloud out the Lord's influence in their life. And so we see God responds to Jeremiah, who became known as the weeping prophet, who preached day and night for these people to turn their hearts back to the Lord. This is what the Bible says in Jeremiah 7, verse 16 and 17. It says, therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession for me or to me, for I will not hear you. Do not see what do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire. And notice this part. It says, and the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? And what's even more interesting is, you go back to this text here. It says, the children gathered wood, the fathers kindled the fire, but it says the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. It's amazing because you can trace this origin back. And you can follow the history back as to where this kneading or making cakes or baking cakes for the queen of heaven, this queen of heaven in history would become known as the goddess of fertility. Uh, and there's many different names for that goddess of fertility, but it all always goes back. Notice this. And it's quite interesting. It goes back to a goddess of fertility known as Eostor. Eostor. What does that sound like? Eostor. Have you ever heard, notice, kneading cakes or dough for the queen of heaven? Um, have you ever heard of hot cross buns? This is, a, this is an interesting thing. If you do the history on hot cross buns, of course, it eventually became a Christian tradition. And of course, this is just a picture of what uh, someone's version of the hot cross bun looks like. But if you do the history of this, it's interesting. You find it finds its origin all the way back to pagan origin, where people, the women of these certain paganistic cultures would knead the dough and they would create dough to bake these little rolls or these little cakes. And on these little cakes, they would put the image or the emblem of a cross not because it meant or represented Jesus Christ and his, his, resur or his uh, sacrifice, uh, but it pointed to the four different divisional phases of the moon, the moon goddess, Eostor. Okay, again, Eostor, Ishtar, Ashtoreth, and it kind of, of course, eventually, if you follow the origin, it leads to uh, some of the paganistic practices that you find in the history of Easter. That's right. The, the, what, we, what we consider and some of us consider as a good Christian tradition, Easter, celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, many of these practices, my friends, including you know, even hot cross buns, find its origin way back in these paganistic practices that, again, does not have a good origin, not have a good story to it. But my friends, we have brought ourselves to probably one of the most interesting texts in all of Scripture. And it's found in the text of Ezekiel chapter 8. And of course, this comes within the context of the children of Israel who eventually end up in Babylonian captivity because of their, uh, because of their pagan practices and their disregard of God's commandments and not obeying the Lord. Now, I want to read this from Scripture because it's a, it's a rather lengthy passage. But I want to read this to you. And then, of course, at the end of this reading here, I'm going to pull up the main text up on the screen so you can see it. But I'm going to Ezekiel chapter 8 if you want to follow me. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please get them out so you can see them. I'm going to Ezekiel chapter 8, and I'm going to be, begin reading in verse 5. And I want you to see this very clearly. What is happening here? Ezekiel is in vision. And he's living in the time when the children of Israel have been carried off to Babylon. And why have they been carried off? Because they have basically done everything they can to offend God. And in this case, they are preparing to, be, to go into 70 horrible years of Babylonian captivity. And so what is it that ultimately offended God and made God evacuate his own temple to leave them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon? This is what we're about to read, Ezekiel chapter 8, and I'm going to start reading in verse 5. Listen very carefully as the Lord is showing Ezekiel 
what the children of Israel have done to make him leave and forsake them in the sense that they have forsaken him. They've pushed him out. So notice what it is. This is starting with verse 5. It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar, toward the north, and there, excuse me, north toward the altar, uh, the gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Okay? It says, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And then he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they do there. So I went in and saw that there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. This, of course, is in the, the, the house of God, in the inner courts of the Lord. Notice verse 11. It says, And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jezaniah, the son of Shephan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. What is that? That's worship. They're worshiping. They're, 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 they're tossing incense and, and, and sending up incense for these false idols. Verse 12, then he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Every man in the room and his idols, for they say the Lord does not see us and the Lord has forsaken the land. He says, and he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations uh, that they are doing. And then verse 14, very interesting. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Now, I told you and showed you earlier, Tammuz is basically a Middle Eastern kind of Mesopotamian god of fertility, okay? Okay. There's a whole lot that I can say about little Tammuz, all right? But I want to make this clear, my friends. These women are weeping for Tammuz, all right? And uh, let's continue reading. I mean, he's, his mind is blown. But notice what the Bible says now beginning. Oh, excuse me. The reference at the bottom is wrong. Uh, do not pay attention to this reference. I had a typo here. It should say Ezekiel chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 15. So notice what it says here. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again and you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Oh, okay. So let me, let me show you this for a moment. Let me give you a picture of this. We're going to come back to little Tammuz momentarily, but I want to show you this very quickly. There's a significance to the fact that their backs are toward the temple and they're facing the east, worshiping the sun. So who are they worshiping? They're worshiping the sun god. Their women are crying and weeping for Tammuz. And these men have their back toward the temple of God. In other words, they've forsaken God. They're saying, talk to the hand, Lord. We don't, we're not listening. And they're worshiping the Son. Now, this is significant in the sense that if you understand how God had them to design the sanctuary, he had them to do the layout from east to west so that the progression of the worship of the sanctuary was to go from east to west so that their backs would be toward the sun. In other words, sending a message that only God is the true God, not the paganistic deities of the world and their false sun God that they, that they claim to be their all-powerful, uh, almighty deity, the God of the sun. God was sending a message to you. You're going to be different than all the other nations. You're going to build this temple from east to west so that when you worship me and the progression of my worship that's happening in my house, your back will be toward the sun and you will be worshiping me, the only God. My friends, this is powerful. And if you see this from the perspective 
of Israel today. Uh, look at this right here. This is a this is an uh, artist portrayal of the Wailing Wall there in Jerusalem. You'll see the Dome of the Rock there on the left in the picture, and you see the Wailing Wall. That is the west wall of uh, of of the sanctuary that was left there in Jerusalem. It's still there today, and it's interesting that uh, they call it the Wailing Wall, but it's the West Wall. In other words. What they're actually doing, when you walk up to that little wall and they put their little prayers in, in the cracks of the rock and all that, they're actually facing the westward wall, which is actually on the other side of that in, re, in the real world when that was standing, would have been on the other side of that wall would have been the, the area of the most holy place. But here's what's interesting. This is another, it's a real image. So here, right here is the, is the wall. That's the west wall. So everything to the right of that wall would be eastward. Notice where those people are facing today. They're in, in, in Judea or right there in, in Jerusalem. They're facing the opposite direction that God intended them to face. Now, I'm not making a big deal out of this to say that they're all, you know, pagan worshipers and all that. What I'm saying is, is notice that it's, it's opposite. This is exactly what was happening in Ezekiel chapter 8 in this false worship. Here's another image. So you have, there's the Wailing Wall. And all of this region right here would have been where the Temple Mount would have stood. Huge, huge place right? And that, that where you see that arrow would have been the westward wall. That would have been the region or the area in which the most holy place would have been. And so it would have went from east to west, not west to east. But when people go to that wailing wall today, they're facing west when they're giving their worship. And again, when God had established it, he told them, don't face the, the east because of the, uh, because of the pagan nations around you. God wanted to send a message. So what does all of this have to do with us in closing? I'm coming down to my last few slides here, and I want you to get this in closing, my friends. Powerful what we're about to establish. It's interesting, little Tammuz, I have to mention him, when it says that the women were weeping for Tammuz, there's so many things that you can trace back in history and find its origin. Tammuz was a god of fertility. And if you study the history, it's interesting that it said that what would happen is, according to pagan legend and how they would worship him, they believed that when the seasons were changing and it became the fall of the year where everything was dying off and the leaves were dying and the flowers were dying and the grass was dying, and, oh, that then little Tammuz had been taken into the underworld. That little, um, I think I might have just gotten a message. I hope I didn't, my audio didn't cut out. We shall see. Okay, no, it didn't. Obviously, my audio is still going. So, when the fall came, they believed that little Tammuz had been taken down into the underworld where his spirit had died momentarily, which is why all, again, fertility, God of fertility, all, everything was dying off. His spirit was not there anymore. And so they would have the season, obviously the winter season, but then the, when the year would come back around, when it would get close to the time for spring, get this, 40 days before the sun would reach its vernal equinox, therefore bringing us into the time of spring where everything would start coming back alive again and the birds would start chirping and the grass would grow and the flowers would bloom. 40 days before the sun would reach its vernal equinox, women, these women, many of these pagan religions, these women would weep for Tammuz. That's what you're seeing in scripture. When it says he saw them weeping for Tammuz, they're weeping for Tammuz. Now, what's interesting is if you do, do this, 40 days before, okay, this particular time period, uh, it brings you about the time to what we would call today the time in which we would celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? 40 days before. And then what's interesting is there's church groups today that actually, if you trace the origin back to, uh, for instance, Lent, have you ever heard of Lent that some uh, Christian uh, groups practice today? course they do it they try to do it under the guise of you know we're trying to you know practice lent we're trying to give up something for the lord and which the, the principle behind that's great right but you should you should be able to give something up for the lord all the time right uh not not if it's something you feel like you got to give up that's bad maybe the lord is is trying to sanctify you from that permanently but some people practice lent 40 days of lent where did it come from it finds its origin back to the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. and get this if you do the history again You'll find that they, they believe that the birthday or the birth of this little, uh, you know, son of the sun, fertility, Amuz, they believed that his birthday was on December 25th. 
<laughs> which we know that Jesus's birthday is not literally on December 25th. We know that Jesus probably would have been born in the fall sometime around, you know, end of September, October sometime. But again, today, why do we celebrate Jesus's birthday on December 25th? Not that it's not, you know, the idea of celebrating Christ's birth, I think it's a wonderful thing, right? We don't want to get caught up in all the paganistic, you know, idol practices of how, how some people uh, practice Christmas. But nonetheless, it's a wonderful thing to take time out to observe the fact that the Son of God came into the world and was born. So I don't, I personally don't, you know, celebrate Christmas like the world celebrates it. But again, this whole concept of December 25th, it has its pagan roots. And what has happened? Notice, notice how we're following this. Has the, who's behind all of this? Who's behind all of this creeping in of these pagan practices and pagan origins? Who's behind all this, my friends? It is the devil. It's the enemy. And my friends, notice, why is he still doing it? You would think, man, he couldn't defeat Jesus. He couldn't defeat Jesus at the cross. What in the world is he still doing? Revelation 12 gives us the answer. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, uh, for earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. My friends, why is the devil still attacking us today? Why is he still unfolding and trying to creep in all of these pagan practices and trying to eclipse Jesus from our lives and from the church. My friends, it's because he knows he has but a short time. He knows that Jesus is going to win in the end. It's a suicide mission. If he's going to die, he's going to take out as many people as possible. Now, you may be asking here in closing tonight, and I want to make this very, very clear as we are preparing to end this presentation. In fact, let me, let me go back into here real quick and get past um, this. Uh, I'm going to get into this right here. I want to give these scriptures in closing. I want us to see this very clearly. What this is setting us up for is tomorrow night's presentation, because what we're seeing as we've just traced through the Bible, we see the enemy's plan. He's constantly trying to eclipse the influence of Jesus by bringing in heathenistic and worldly practices that become traditions or, or, or substitutions for the work and the influence of God. And you might say, well, I'm a Christian and I don't have any of those in my life today. Or my church doesn't practice any of those things. Or there's nothing that we're doing that the devil has deceived us into practicing that might have pagan origin. Well, let me give you what the scripture predicts. First Timothy chapter four, verse one and two. Now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Don't miss that. What kind of, what kind of, what, what's from the demons? Doctrines. Does, de does demons care about doctrine? Yes, they do. But they don't want you to care about the good doctrine. They want to give you some of that good old false doctrine. And so it says right here, they are deceived by spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, they've come to the point to where their minds are made up, that they're on the right path, they're doing the right thing. All the while they have been given in and they have been deceived by these doctrines of the devils. The devil has slid his way in. And that's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine or teaching. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. So in closing tonight, my friends, I want to ask you a question. Are you sure that the enemy has not set up camp in your Christian experience? You say, Ryan, I'm sure. There was once a time when I was sure. I was convinced that I'm doing all that I know to do that's right. And you know, there's some truth to that. I think a lot of us are doing truthfully all that we know to do that is right. But sometimes we can be genuine about our experience, but be genuinely mistaken. Just as the children of Israel, oh, so many times through Scripture, took their eyes off the Lord, forsook His way, and eventually it led them into constant rebellion, 
constant heathenistic practices that ultimately cost them in the end. I want to ask you today, is the devil still at work to bring in pagan practices, pagan influences that is trying to that he's trying to pervert the Christian experience, to usurp the power and the offices of Jesus Christ, to eclipse the work and the powerful work of Jesus Christ in the lives of Christians today? Are you sure that there's no influence at all that we see uh, in the Christian Christians uh, uh, church today? Well, I'm going to tell you, my friends, I'm convinced that there's more than just a few. And tomorrow night, okay, that's this next picture says a lot. I'm not going to say anything about it, but this next picture says a lot. Is sun god worship still in the church today? Is the is the is the influence of sun worship still creeping behind the doors in Christianity today? Tomorrow night I'm going to uncover from scripture the greatest religion ever in the history of the Christian church. The devil does not want you to hear this message. So tonight when we close in prayer, I'm going to be praying for a special, special protection around all of us that tomorrow night as we believe in faith and trust in the Lord, that he's going to bring us back for a spiritual blessing that is going to change our lives forever. My friends, the devil's hard at work, but God is working harder. Don't be discouraged because Jesus says he's got the whole world in his hands. I love that song. He's got the whole world in his hands. The devil is on a suicide mission. He's going to take out as many as he can, but he already knows he has a short time because Jesus Christ is the victor. Jesus Christ has won at the cross and Jesus Christ will win in the end. But until then, we still have to, we have to unearth these deceptions of the enemy. We have to bring about and shine bright the righteous doctrines and the righteous truth of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we're going to do again tomorrow night, right? When we come back at six o'clock PM, don't miss that. Please tell a friend.